Hi and welcome to Catholic Unscripted number six. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. So there's a lot of things that have come to our attention this week, isn't there? First of all, we've got the continuation of the synodal process from 2023 to 2024. Um, there's been an appointment by Pope Francis to the Pontifical Academy for Life of Dr. Mariana Mazzucati, who is, as far as I can tell, a pro-abortion atheist. And also, Gavin, you've written about this, the exclusion zone around an abortion clinic in Bournemouth, where prayer and the scattering, the sprinkling of holy water is forbidden. And there's a thread that runs through all of these, isn't there, Mark? So maybe if you want to start by telling us what that is. Yeah, well, I think it um, relates to the way that we understand democracy, um, especially in terms of the fact that we don't really seek democracy from the church. We seek revelation. And yet it seems that the church is trying to impose some form of democracy on us. With the synod of synodality, it's like they're going to keep asking us the same question until they get the answers that they that they want. So um, no one took part in the first year, first phase. So they're going to keep pushing forward until you know. The, I mean, one of the th interesting things about it was that Pope Francis actually said before the consultation process that um, it would be a tragedy if we didn't get decent numbers of people responding, and decent numbers of people haven't responded. But it doesn't seem daunted. It's just going to extend it. And I think what worries me is that this is actually what the whole thing was about from the beginning. And that is to change the, the, the way that the church works, um, you know, into this, like this, the idea of synodality, which we don't, it's not a term that's anywhere in the Vatican II documents. It's not anything that we're familiar with. You know, any of us who studied theology, I was chatting to some really clever friends in the week and saying is it just me have I missed this somewhere in in you know church teaching but it's just it's just a new thing that they've made up and it seems to what they seem to mean is that they're going to make the make it basically uh, a copy of the way that the church of England is run which is that instead of us basing our faith on divine revelation on scripture and tradition and the magisterium that we're going to have regular meetings and decide, you know, in the words of uh, Cardinal Grech, uh, we're going to discern what the Holy Spirit is, at what direction the Holy Spirit is asking us to go. And, you know, he's actually said that could be something completely new outside of the documents of Vatican II, or, you know, um, it could be a break with everything that's gone before. It doesn't seem to matter. And the way that they seem to want to enact, I mean, it, the, the way they want to enact it is by breaking away from everything we know and believe in as, as Catholics and sort of uh, establishing this church, which is just based on um, people getting together and deciding what they're going to do next. Um, and I think this is what uh, Cardinal Muller said in his interview when he said that this is absolutely a disaster. You know, that this is a really dangerous time for the church. He said it was a hostile takeover. Can yeah. I tell you a bit what happened to the Church of England? Because it's, it's you know, this is, as Mark said, this is the route that people are going through. First of all, many people have said that Catholics are not very well catechized today. So by asking the laity what they think, you're asking people who have been more shaped by secularism than they have by the faith. Well, that's a really quite problematic thing to do. Uh, in Anglican terms, there is no catechism. There is no shaping. And when you ask the laity what they thought about, about church affairs, they brought to the questions all their political prejudices particularly from the left, mainly from the left, because there was a kind of political uniformity. I think, I, think, I think there was only one bishop in the whole of the Church of England who was not profoundly against Brexit. Uh, and so there was a kind of self-selecting leftish, secularish culture in the Church of England. And when you, when you ask questions about the way in which decisions were made, people were quite clearly, epistemologically, bringing their political worldviews and saying, well, the church must conform to what I think are the right values that I've developed politically. There was no sense of an awareness of what tradition had, had done. And of course, everyone picked, chose their own favourite bits of the Bible to justify their political preferences. But it seems to me that synodality is replicating exactly this. And, and the, one, the one moment when the church can act as an antidote to secularism by saying, here is revelation. This is what we've been given. You need to test the way in which you manage human affairs by what God wants. That's the one point where it seems now that the church is 
giving up on that. Uh, and in, uh, in a way that, as you quite rightly earlier on, Mark said, mirrors antithetically what democracy is doing. Where we need democracy politically, we're on the verge of having it taken away from us, again, mainly by the left. And the terrifying thing that, that's going on in Parliament at the moment is not just that the votes of the people have been completely dis discarded by inner, inner groups, but that actually when these people fail, as fail they look like they will, they'll be replaced by a leftist government that will make what's happened so far against Christians look like child's play, because we know we know what, what uh, the left intends to do, and it involves taking away our democratic rights and replacing them with something else. So here we have the church failing to do revelation when it needs to and not and, and pushing fake democracy, and we have politics pushing, pushing authoritarianism and not giving us the democracy we need to contain it. I think it's an incredibly dangerous time. I, I sort of tweeted earlier today that it seems like the Labour Party has adopted 1984 as its manifesto document. Mm. Um, and what a time for the for the Conservatives to completely implode. Um, the lack of like democratic principle that you've got. It seems like Sue Ella Braverman's uh, resignation was purely based on the fact that she recognised they weren't going to adhere to their manifesto pledges, which was something that she obviously, like all the things that made that, um, interesting, in, in, innovative, and um, you know, sort of attractive, have all been discarded now, and you can see them putting in these. Like, I mean, Grant Shapps is just atrocious, isn't he? And um, you, like, you kind of think it's the same middlemen being put into power again now. Um, this homogenous sort of um, quasi, it doesn't really, it's not conservative in any way sense or, or form it seems to be sort of more liberal democrat than than anything else and th from the left's point of view um completely informed by this woke sort of uh identity politics which mean which is you know as we've sort of discussed before about caroline farrow's experiences it, what it ends up being is the thought police mm -hmm. what you you've got the opposite of what should be happening we just need a switch around because in government what you have is the people have spoken. They've said what they want. They want tighter controls on migration. They they want the police to do their job uh, properly and to prevent robberies, burglaries, and not to uh, waste their time uh, standing around watching climate protesters on the street. That's what they want, but they're being prevented from having what they want by those who think they know better. And in the church, we have those who know better because Christ uh, gave us his will for his church, for his people, and all we're meant to do is guard it. And we have the opposite. We have the church saying we want to go to the will of the people that's the very place that's where we shouldn't be asking uh so not navel gazing and listening to the people because jesus told us this is what i want you to go forth not to sit around and discuss it's a bit like in schools in the sort of tw uh, early 2000s there was um early to mid 2000s there was a real push for pupil councils let's get the kids more involved in their education and the kids get more involved in their education. That's great. What do we want? We want, we want girls to wear trousers. We want to do double drama and less maths. And, and suddenly you have all these teachers biting their nails thinking, oh, no, what are we going to do? We've asked them for their opinion, but we know because we know best that they need to do maths and that they should wear this and that their hair should be like this. And now it's all falling apart because you've given the pupils too much voice. And so it's hard for you to establish your rules. And when there's no rules, then there's chaos. So the church has the, the authority of, of Christ, and it should be just focused on that, on as someone wrote this week in, in I don't know his name, actually, you'll know, Mark. I can't even remember the publication. Rather than considering ways for Holy Church to bring the fire of her divine teachings to a wheezing culture, drawing its la last breath, it chooses the exhausted psychobabble of the transgressive 70s. So it's all mixed yeah. up. It's not as it should be. I love that. A great phrase. The, um, can, I, can I talk about Bournemouth a little bit? Um, mm. Just because it's, it, it really, it, it's hugely on my mind and I think it affects everybody. So perhaps as a preamble to it, we should say that when we talk about left and right, we're not really talking uh, politically in the terms that we've been used to when I, I grew up with, where essentially it was a difference between different kinds of economic policy. Mm. Uh, we're really talking about democracy and anti-democracy. So what the, the right remains democratic, but the left has chosen to become anti-democratic. Uh, and, and those are the political terms we're talking in at the moment. The difficulty with this thing in Bournemouth is, is that it's, it's, a mo it's a moment when 400 years of history suddenly stopped dead. Um, I, I was delighted to become a Catholic, and on becoming a Catholic, I was astonished 
uh, the propaganda that the state had used against Catholicism. Uh, and although very often the, the, the martyrdoms of Elizabeth and Mary were contrasted, M Mary was there for five or six years. Under Elizabeth's reign, there was a, there was a perpetual and completely draconian uh, propaganda campaign against the mass. It's extraordinary that, that the mass itself should have been so dangerous to the state. And so in the last 400 years, things have got slightly better. And, and indeed, I think that uh, Catholicism is, is one of the few, perhaps the only agency that's capable of resisting this anti-theist attack from the left. But suddenly Catholicism, for the first time since Elizabeth I, has been outlawed. OK, so it's been outlawed specifically in order to give uh, pregnant women some kind of protection against being harassed. And, and one can be sympathetic with that, except that as so often, the presentation, the, the, the presenting reasons are not the real reasons. So women are not being hacked to abortion clinics. What you have is Catholics praying, praying for the lives of people who are, who are about to have their lives taken away from them. And, uh, you know, they're clearly they're help. going to be... I think it's important that help. we point out Absolutely. That, God, Mark, know, explain that. Well, just, uh, you know, there are lots of people who have been helped, um, who, who are going out of crisis. You know, they're in a crisis point and they go to the abortion centre looking for help. And that there, you know, there are lots of examples that I'm personally aware of where people have been given the option to not have to go through that trauma. And the people who do it are extraordinarily brave and compassionate and empathic. Um, you know, the, the accusations leveled at them about harassment and, you know, it's just, I've, I've never seen an example of it. I'm just totally unaware of anything like that going on. Wait, go on. So, so you're, but, but, but in, order, in order to stop this help being given, and perhaps a life being preserved, a life, a baby being given up to adopt for adoption to parents who are desperate, who are infertile themselves and are desperate to have a child. I mean, my understanding is that for, for people who have fertility issues, and increasingly one of the things feminism has done for women is to force them to work in the marketplace under a, an economic burden that then means that when they want to have children, they find it increasingly difficult. The one time when you might be able to, 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 to solve that through adoption, once again, the secular state is attacking in this, this draconian way. But it was a sign, <laughs> the nonsense in this signage, the idea that you couldn't spill holy water on the ground. What council employee is going to be able to tell the difference between holy water and non-holy water? What council employee is going to tell whether you're praying or not? What is this thought police stuff? It's, it's, it's I mean, the ludicrousness is proportionate to its to its evil, to its its danger, and um, I, it's again, trying to there's portray us as radicals as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. You know, the rhetoric yeah. is that they're trying to say, "Oh, look at these lunatics!" You know, these unreasonable people um, who are trying to stop women from accessing healthcare, and that, I, I, I just don't recognise that narrative at all. And that's why language want... is so important. You, you talk about accessing healthcare; it's always presented as 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 healthcare i think it was um the guy from babylon b seth dillon on uh matt frad who said no it wasn't matt frad i can't remember it, he said what was Seth it? rogan he was on seth rogan wasn't he oh joe rogan joe rogan yeah joe right. rogan that's yeah. It, yeah he said uh, abortion is healthcare like rape is making love you know the language yes. matters the language really matters and that's why often that's the point of access is into the language so let's call it healthcare and it's interesting because when i teach about abortion the young people start by saying we start by saying well what is abortion and often they'll start by saying well it's it's abortion is when a woman is so poor or in such a difficult situation that she can't keep her baby and it's like well what does that mean she can't keep her baby what's happening so the the, the thought about what's actually happening it isn't in the mix it's all just about about the poor woman who we've said already you know of course in, in is in a crisis and needs support and, and love and care and perhaps not enough's being done, but the answer is not to end the life of another human being, because that's what it is. It isn't the mother's life. It's a separate, distinct, whole human being. With, and without patronising our audience too much, I wondered if we might have a little discussion about that, the principles that you articulated a little bit earlier there, Gavin, about the left and the right. When we talk about the left and the right, what we're really talking about from a Catholic point of view is the principle of subsidiarity isn't it it's the idea that people should be like the difference between big government government dictating so you give all your wealth to the government and the government decides what's right and wrong for you 
and we, we're referring to that as the left and um, the right, which isn't necessarily always the case at the moment. They're all a bit of a mishmash, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the, the idea that you should be free to make your own decisions in, in as much as that's possible to do so. That's the Catholic principle of subsidiarity, mm -hmm. um, which is Catholic social teaching as far as um, politics is concerned, if you like, how we should make our decisions. Yes, and the difficulty is that in the last 30 years, the whole political spectrum has shifted far to the left. It wasn't clear before the Spanish Civil War uh, quite how dangerous the Soviet Union was going to be. Um, and one of the things that I did on becoming a Catholic was to reread the, the history of the Spanish Civil War, because I wanted to understand why people who believed in democracy and the Republic wanted to shoot nuns and priests mm -hmm. and to kill them in large numbers. I couldn't make sense of that. And I was brought up. Uh, on the left, in terms of the Spanish Civil War, all my literary heroes went to fight for the Republic against the fascists. And then I discovered, once again, the language was immensely misleading. And I'm not suggesting that uh, what happened on the uh, Franco side in the, in the war was anything I want to support. I'm simply saying that, that the analysis that, that, that preceded it was flawed and didn't tell you the whole truth. And I feel we're at this stage now where uh, something like the Spanish Civil War. I mean, a, a new political crisis is erupting all over the world. And it's being presented to us in terms that uh, of freedom and independence and dignity and human rights. But actually, if you ask spiritual and sort of political questions, I think that's really important. Otherwise, we're falling into the same trap as Church of England Synod. If we ask, if we ask questions that are informed by our metaphysics, by our spirituality, the fear at the moment is that the, the there's a huge political movement which de is determined to outlaw Christianity, to outlaw Christian morals, to outlaw freedom of choice, to outlaw freedom of speech. And that's what we're fighting against. Now, to be called right when you're doing that is, is again, another, is another great misnomer. Left and right don't mean anything any more than, I don't think that fascists and communists mean anything anymore. They're, they're used as insults, especially fascists. So the problem for us is that the, that the Catholic Church, I mean, one thing is I'm very glad to be a Catholic, is that if the Catholic Church could act together and, and, and publicly implemented the public Christian social teaching, then there would be some means of standing against the, the incredible sophisticated tide of brainwashing that the, 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 the media, multimedia in particular, and social media have inflicted on our society in the last 20 years. So that, that even in the Tory party, there don't appear to be anyone, there's no one on the right the, the very few people who actually believe in, in what used to be called conservative politics, and, and I mean the social ones, social teaching ones, uh, independence, uh, the responsibility of the individual and the capacity for freedom of speech, they're not there or they keep, they're keeping silent. Yeah, it's the, um, the, the destruction of the family as well. The family are the building blocks of society. Yeah. And this goes back to, we talked about education last time, um, so the more government take control of our children's education, take more money out of our pockets, spend it how they think best, the less choice there is for parents, uh, for families, as you say, subsidi subsidiarity, Mark, that, that keeping it in this, in this uh, smaller scale so that we can best judge what is best for our families, for our children, that's being taken away. We see it more and more, don't we? And education is a brilliant sphere to watch that uh, drain of mm. um, authority where parents you know like all the time whenever I see teachers just this morning on breakfast television I saw a teacher and um, he was talking about the concerns over the uh, cost of living crisis which is a real you know worry but he he was basically saying like now I'm paraphrasing but what he was saying was oh children aren't safe at home with their parents mm. and school school is that safe place I mean that certainly was my experience of school um but it, it, like it's worrying that this is the narrative that we're it's like you know parents are rubbish and I always think if we have got a problem in society where we've got um, a lot of parents um, who are problematic you know aren't able to mm. properly bring up their children I mean, that is the breakdown of the family anyway isn't it and the breakdown yeah. of marriage um, then you know we should be empowering parents rather than schools you know we should be helping families and finding ways to support them in bringing up their children. Again, this should be the work of the church. This is, uh, yeah. but the bishops are talking about climate change and where the, you know, the, uh, 
the embassy is in Jerusalem and all, you know, like it's really interesting to see the things, the, the things that they, the flags that they decide to hoist, you know, they very, they're very vocal when they want to be on some points, but we, you know, we said last time this fight against abortion should be at the absolute forefront of everything that's going on in the Bishop's Conference, I think at the moment. And I just can't believe Mondrian, that they are silent. No, absolutely. Rodrea, I think is, sorry, Catherine. Go no, go, go. Rod Dreher has suggested that the battle that we're lamenting is not being won, has been long lost, and that we need to think about stage two, what we're going to do next. Uh, I'm at my, my small little mill house in, in France, uh, and one of the, pe some of the people I've been meeting recently are Catholics who are looking to move into rural France uh, and build com Catholic communities around cathedral towns, minsters, uh, abbeys, uh, in order to fly, in order to be away from the capital and from the state and to be under the radar, so that the kind of the kind of Christian communities, I mean, it makes it much harder to uh, to to run state propaganda in a school if ninety percent of your pupils are are, are faithful Catholics. And so the uh, one of the one of the the, the the strategies is to try and find to to rebuild Christian communities away from the center of influence, where to some extent parents and the church can begin to be given the proper responsibilities that they ask for. Well, I was astonished to discover this is being thought about amongst Catholic communities in France. I don't think anything is being talked about in England remotely like that, uh, but it should be. We should, we should be waking up to the fact that if we don't find ourselves underground networks where we can come together as Catholic Christians, not just Catholics, of course, but Christians across the whole board, then the state is going to have uh, its hand around uh, our windpipe and and throttle the life out of us, take away all our freedoms. That there is no movement to restore Christian freedom to our society. On the contrary, every single month brings a new outrage, uh, a new form of defenestration for the believer, in professionally and and culturally. Mm, it's the blindness as well to to what's happening. Because you, you it's you have a problem, you see a problem, and then you try and cure it with the same. Uh, formula the same medicine that caused the problem in the first place and how that isn't more obvious I don't know you look at the a concern about women about women not being safe on the streets so what we need to do is provide more sex education we've got high rates of abortion and STIs we need more sex education there's no stopping to think has the strategies that we've used before worked no maybe we should scrap them because what's really gonna help young men to grow up and to know how to respect a woman is looking at the model of Christ who sacrificed himself. Husbands love your wives as Christ loves, loves the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself completely and utterly and emptied himself for love of the church, for love of his people. He didn't self-indulge. He didn't give in to every whim. He stood up against the uh, Pontius Pilate, uh, strong in, in, in truth. The, these are what, this is what we should be teaching young men. And they're desperate, desperate, desperate for this message. They're desperate for truth. And instead we're saying, oh, well, you, you know you shouldn't touch a woman so let's try and draw up a contract of what's it it's absolute rubbish it's nonsense teach young men how to respect themselves and women teach young women how to respect themselves and others find it in the faith yeah. and we were talking about the papal academy earlier on and the appointment of secularists pro-abortion secularists to it and asking really what the what the papal strategy might be behind that and i think the difficulty that lies behind our discomfort is that what you've just described, Catherine, is a, is a vacuum of ethical teaching. And we've noticed that, that Catholic men, are, Catholic young men are being attracted to Islam mm. because, as, uh, as I think Peterson re re recollected, Islam contains masculine virtues in a way that Catholic Christianity has given up on. There's been a kind of feminization of the, of the church. No, it's not just about lace and pretty colors, uh, but it is about homosexuality. Uh, and this feminization or demasculinization of the church, we better, better with it, is leaving a terrible vacuum. Yeah. The Orthodox have got a certain balance between the, the, the symbolism, the cultural feeling for masculinity and femininity. But the Catholic Church, with its demasculinization, is leaving a most terrible gap. And into it comes Islam. It reminds me of the way in which the, the West in, the, in, in 1054. Uh, completely failed to manage its, its, its unity. It fell out and squabbled so badly that when the schism came into that, into that gap left by the schism, Islam flowed in a, in a devastating way. 
in a way that meant we lost the whole of the Christian East. It's, the lesson seems to be that if you fail to be properly Christian, then, then some lesser uh, and, and you know, lesser good will, will take over and take responsibility. And I would say Islam is that lesser good now, as it has been in the past. And although people may say to themselves, well, members of the Papal Academy, who really cares? It's, it's a sense that the center of the church has lost the plot. It's lost its sense of vocation to provide salt and light, real Christian integrity to places of public influence so that the faith can be articulated by, by powerfully committed intellectual people whose job it is to bring their minds and the wisdom of Christ to the public space. But instead, we're being given secularists and people who seem to make it a, mar a mark of pride to attack the faith of the church. It's a strategy I find it very hard to understand. The whole project of, of the the whole project of the synod is a feminine project. It's opening up a space uh, and saying, "Let's let's what what can we need to listen? Let's open up this space." It's not giving as the church should give. It's it's saying we'll receive, and so this is a feminine project. And it's no wonder mm -hmm. that there's been less than 0.05 percent uh, response in most countries, less than less than eight at the absolute most, and that's it. And so what do we do? Let's stretch it out for another year. And what's going to happen in the meantime, as Gavin said? The 8% was of baptised Catholics as well, not of, yeah. or of practising Catholics, not of, you know, everyone. But it's like the figures are way lower of that. But I think you've both made a brilliant point there, which is like the Islam point. The way that I see it is that it's about clear teaching. Yeah. Islam, is, you know, I don't, I think that, all right, there's some good things in Islam, the things that copy Christianity, but other than that, it's really quite a dangerous ideology. But it is clear. What, yeah. they, what it teaches is clear and accessible to people. And that's why I think it's attracting young men. And I think that the problem here that we see, and the Pontifical Academy for Life is a brilliant example, is that we're muddy in the waters. What does the church teach? Well, it's up to you, really. It's whatever you decide it is. Mm. What a load of rubbish. Mm. You know, if we've not got a clear message for our young people, there's no, I'm not, I'm hardly surprised that they're walking away. I think the way that my children have retained the faith is by us talking about the way that it is efficacious in your life and the way that it affects your life and you practice it. It becomes a culture, something that you're engaged in every day, you know, all day. I, and I'd just and like so, to say that, that, that there was, as, an, as an Anglican, uh, <laughs> one of the first things I decided to do on becoming a Catholic was to pick up the catechism and read it. I, it was the most thrilling document. It's a bit like after, after a while, having become an evangelical and fallen in love with Jesus, uh, I, I, I fell in love with the Nicene Creed because I discovered in the Nicene Creed this, this, this absolutely wonderful, poetic affirmation of who... Formula of belonging, what, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and, and I'll never forget seeing Coptic Christians come out onto the streets of Egypt after the Muslims had firebombed their churches and they sung the Nicene Creed in order to tell the Muslims they still believed in the divine, in the divinity of Christ. It was the most powerful way of doing it. I, I'd like to see Christians walking around the restricted areas of Bournemouth, making the signs of the cross, sprinkling holy water and singing the creed. Do it by all means a, a street away from the abortion clinic. But in order to undermine this so-called safe zone, which so far from being a safe zone is an asphyxiation zone, um, sucking the oxygen out of the life of the community, both in terms of faith and the freedom of speech. But if we do nothing as Catholics, then yeah. then we can't be surprised that that, uh, that those who oppose the faith and those who are anti God will just be given an easy ride. Mm. And that's the thing with the Pontifical Academy for Life, where it was established. I think it was in 1996 as a an academy for evangelization to teach the beautiful truths of the catholic faith with regards to marriage and family life um, and now it's been subverted like one of the first things that pope francis did was to sack all the you know the wonderful people who are engaged in this process and to introduce people who you know like immediately it was obvious from their history that a lot of the people involved had ideas which were contrary to catholic teaching mm. and so instead of it being about extolling the virtues of Christianity, of Catholic truth, the way that, you know, the, the apostolic faith, it becomes about challenging those truths. You know, how can we not see these yeah, things? I, 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 I was completely shocked. I was completely shocked when I discovered that one of the first acts of the papacy was to close down those wonderful, uh, you'll know the names, I'm afraid I don't, but those wonderful centers on the family. 
for, for the for, for scholastic support of family teaching that John Paul II had set up in Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that why, why would any Catholic want to close those down? I I didn't understand then, and I and I still don't. The other the other thing that I think is dangerous, and you see it happening, and it's something I've heard uh, from, let's say. Father James Martin and others, is this attempt to equate, because I want to look at the abortion again with the, the Bournemouth thing and also the PAL appointment, is to equate um, other clear, like questions, moral questions that are of a prudential nature with abortion as if they're all the same. And they're not. And I think that's, that's the really, seamless really, garment. You know, that's approach. the seamless garment approach, which is which is terrible theology. Um, Have you heard about that, Gavin? Is that a familiar? No, well, I, I was just—I was just trying to work it out and see and to discover if I could work out what you meant. No, I haven't heard from it. So, so perhaps you could do, was, but, so, but maybe I'm not the only one. <laughs> no, exactly. It. So it was—it it was an idea that came up that was um, sort of originates with a guy called uh, Bernardine. Bernardine, yeah. Yeah, Cardinal yeah. Bernardine. Absolutely atrocious. Yeah. It's, it's going to be it's going to be creeping relativism, isn't it? Whatever yeah, but it is, it's, exactly. but, it's, but it's taken hold really dangerously. Mm. It's taken hold, which is why you find people when you try to speak up for life and you talk about the preeminence of abortion as the right to life, people say, "Well, you cut," and then then you've got you've got to cut carbon emissions and immigrants, and you think <laughs> well, so. What they're doing is they're equating everything, and that is not correct theology. That's wrong. That's, there is a what, in, in the teachings of the church, there's a certain ordering or hierarchy of truths. Now, that's not to say that some things are true and some aren't, but the, that some things are there is scope for prudential judgment. But with some, there simply are not. And this is the absolute that we're talking about that you said may be appealing in Islam. And it certainly is that we have. This is the frustrating thing is we have it. We have it. It's like when we turn to uh, Black Lives Matter and um, and things like this to deal with racism look at the beautiful his rich history of our church teaching it's there it's been there for centuries we just have to look at it so i think this is the veil that's been pulled over people's eyes as well is is this this inability to talk about the preeminence of the right to life and to defend life and to uh, pr protect the unborn because we think well you know everything else is just on a par sorry mark no, well, that's you're exactly. I mean, you're on fire today, Catherine. I have to say <laughs> that's exactly it, and that is what um, you you've seen in the recent um, meetings of the U.S. Bishops Conference, where you've had McElroy. So this awful Bishop McElroy, who's another one who was promoted. I think we spoke about it on another episode, uh, and he was a suffragan bishop who was promoted be above the, you know, the uh, Archbishop to Cardinal by Pope Francis. And these are guys who've been arguing for this seamless garment. Mm -hmm. And basically the, the, the way their argument takes place is within the format of the Bishop's Conference, they're standing up and arguing against the preeminence of, you know, these clear moral evils, you know, and that's what Veritatis Splendor is about. That it's that, um, like the Bernard Haring, the fundamental option, these ideas that, um, you know, everything's, you know, all evil is like, all, it's all the same, immigration, uh, you know, climate change, all these things are all part of the same thing. And we have to, we can't focus on one thing or another. I mean, it's just, it just makes everything a big mush and you can't, yeah, <laughs> it just exactly. becomes meaningless. And if I, if I, if you can indulge me for a moment, I want to turn to the words of Father Jeffrey Kirby. He's a fantastic priest in the US who says about the class, the classic seamless garment theory is contrary to the Catholic moral tradition um, and he says quote many liberal theologians today rely on the busyness the emotive reactions and the flawed catechetical formation of the people in the pews as such they create catchy phrases sorry catchy phrases or illogical comparisons and pass them off as wisdom and counsel they offend the minds and consciousness of believers and people of goodwill by throwing such intellectual bread and circuses into the mix and then they enjoy their influence, popularity, and supposed status as experts on social issues. Such an approach is a violation of the truth and of the sacred trust given to the ordained and to those trained in theology. And just from Pope John Paul II, if you want equal justice for all and true freedom and lasting peace, then defend life. All the great causes that are yours today will have meaning only to the extent that you guarantee the right to life and protest the human person. This is a preeminent issue. It's absolutely crucial that we don't just bung it in the mix with everything else. 
you know, Gavin, you were saying about how brilliant the catechism is. Go to the catechism of the Catholic yeah. Church. I think it's paragraph 1776, the morality of human acts. It's absolutely brilliant, yeah. you know, where it lays out that you've got, you know, you've got acts, you've got circumstances and you've got consequences. And the way that we make decisions, um, you know, through Romans 10 is yeah. absolutely brilliant teaching, you know. And that's what, what I, I, I still don't understand why. You know, the Synod on Synodality, who's heard anything about Mary or Jesus or, you know, I've heard lots about and 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 salvation and together and dialogue and all this stuff. And, you know, we should, give JP2, we should give JP2 the last word, I think, mm. uh, in case we tax the patience of our listeners. But I'm reminded, too, the Catechism can c contain wonderful injunction to the laity to hold bishops and popes to account if they find themselves, if they find that their leaders are not keeping faith with the Catholic tradition. So in case people think that we are being unnecessarily critical or, uh, or, or, or destructive, it's, it's in order to fulfill that part of the catechism that invites the laity to take responsibility to preserve the teaching of the church, should they find that those who were given that responsibility are not fulfilling it. Mm, absolutely right. And on that note, I'm gonna go and listen to my children about what they want for dinner. And uh, sweets. If, it's, if it's spaghetti hoops and sweets, well, so be it. <laughs> Who am I to judge? Okay. Um, Brilliant. <laughs> goodbye. Thanks so much for watching and for listening. And we hope you'll join us again soon. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashton. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience and for yes. your prayers.